into a little bit more with the matrix, with assessment, with intervention, and primarily more about behavior, all right? Um, and you have all the pieces already. This is pretty much sums it up. Brain injury is a puzzle. All the pieces are there, but they're just a little bit in the wrong order. And we just want to kind of help you guys figure out where you're, you know, when, where you're going to go for your resources and, and, and how to move around through all of this, okay? So let's look at this hierarchy from the lens of brain injury. Um, and the reason that we have we decided to spend the whole, spend the whole afternoon on, on behavior um, and the morning on executive functioning is because, as you guys know, first of all, is this okay if I use this mic instead? That other thing was cutting off the blood to my brain. <laughs> and you don't want to see that this afternoon. All right, so. So the reason why we have taken the feedback from all of you over the last couple of years and really focused on executive function and um, behavior is because right up here is where those guys live, right? And as good educators, many of the most complex concerns and questions come to you on kids and it's always about their behavior's out of control, they're aggressive, why are they not doing what I need them to do, why can they not follow the rules, and all of this right up here. As the director or as the coordinator of the, of the brain injury team and as a psychologist, I would say most of the concerns were up here. And it starts at the behavior and the why, why can't this kid. But the reason why we spend so much time on all of this is to help you understand that for most of our kids with neurological issues, whether that be brain injury or autism or mental health issues, the deficits are down here. But we don't stop as educators. We haven't really been trained to look down here and fix these down here. We pretty much stop, start right here. And that, that just sets us off in a whole different direction, right? You're called in for a consultation on a kid who won't behave. That's a whole different kind of approach going into it. And we're going to stop that process, have you go back and reflect, and try to really drill down to what might be underneath it. Because if these things are wobbly, you are not going to have really good executive functioning, nor are you going to make good social emotional decisions. Okay. So we took the feedback from you guys, and you said that's what you want us to focus on. Um, and so we will. There are a couple of tools that we're going to actually give you to help you to drill down to that level of those skill deficits. Um, because you know that the standard assessment tools that you use already, um, the kind of the, the things that we've been using for a number of years, often don't give us that kind of information. If it's a self, if it's a whisk, if it's um, you know, whatever it is, um, a brief, a bask, well, it's not necessarily giving us the kind of information that we need to say, hmm, I think it's an um, attention inhibition issue. And that right there is going to make a difference in terms of your intervention, whatever you decide it to be. All right? So we're going to introduce you to a couple of things and give you the easy button with all of this. One thing that I'm going to show you, and Heather will pass out to at some point whenever, is our behavior injury observation form. Okay? All of these things, let me preface by saying all of these tools that I'm going to show you are on the co-kidswithbraininjury.com -kid, co website. Okay? That's all. It's in your handout. So all of these tools are there, and I'll kind of give them to you in sort of the order that you might want to use them. This brain injury observation form if you kind of get a sense here from just looking at page one, it starts with the bottom level up. So if you are sitting and talking with a parent or with teachers, you're called in, I doubt that the teacher's going to say to you, I believe this kid has an attention inhibition problem. Um, if they knew that, they wouldn't necessarily need you, right? What they're going to say is, this kid cannot sit still. This kid cannot focus. This kid knows it one day, doesn't know it the next. So they're going to give you the behaviors. And as you are sitting with them going through this, or they're filling it out, they're actually checking off for you the areas that are most problematic for this student. And they all cluster 
into those foundational skills or into that pyramid that we gave you, starting from the bottom up, okay? Not the top down, but we want you to pay as, as the most attention to the bottom up. So you're getting information. It seems to be falling into the attention area, processing speed area, and you'll know then where you're going to start your assessments. All right, so those are coming around now. We're going to do some case studies, and you'll actually see these put to, put to use. Um, the way I always think of using this, or have used it with teams, is, is in those problem-solving team meetings. Or give it to a teacher to say, here, you, you go through this first, and you kind of pinpoint for me what the concerns are um, before I come in. But then we can sit down and we can talk about it some more, even. So yes, this is kind of a conversation and a way for them to let you, you know um, of course, you're thinking things like processing speed and sensory motor and all of these things. They're just thinking these behaviors are not. So it doesn't force them to have to know what you know on the pyramid, all right? But it does help you to drill down. So, um, and so Heather brought up a good idea or a good point. CoKidsWithBrainInjury.com is the online resource if you want to download any and all of these things as we talk about them. The other resource is this brain injury manual. And this, is, this was written by a group of um, brain injury specialists in, in schools. Um, it's an advisory team, and we've been meeting for years and years, really, at a coffee shop, working together on this. And after a number of years of working together, it resulted in this book. This book has, um, breaks down to different chapters, which goes into things like the, you know, developmental history, um, different, um, those same skill deficits of attention, processing speed, all of those from the bottom up again, and lots and lots of interventions that are listed in there that we could never even put on slides or put into these little cards for you. So this is the other way. There's an entire chapter devoted to social emotional, trying to understand just what I'm going to go into in a little bit more depth as I go through behavior here. But basically understanding how those skill deficits are impacting your behavior and not assuming it's just willful disobedience. And then 504, IEP, all of that. Okay, so this is your other resource that you can use. All right, and I'll show you one other when we get a little further along. So you might start with your observation form and you're starting, it will start to direct you where you're going. Okay knowing that there are a lot of kids, there's a lot of overlap between some of the behaviors. So there's still going to be misidentification um, and it might, you know, you're still going to have to differentiate between whether it's traumatic brain injury or Asperger's or whatever, but know that there's a lot of differentiation. This is a nice little chart that kind of gives you a sense of what is characteristic of just traumatic brain injury, but you can see that there are so many things that it overlaps with, with autism, with LD, with ED, with ADHD, um, because all of those, as I said, they're all neurologically based, so you can't take the brain out of it. But if it helps for you to kind of, you know, even narrow down your thinking a little bit more, you can. If you're not looking at a kid with a traumatic brain injury, then look in these other categories to see where some of the skill deficits tend to typically impact them. All right, so. Now that we've kind of set this up in the lens of brain injury, let's go into assessments, okay? Evidence-based assessments and interventions for brain injury. Well, that, that's kind of the dilemma here, okay? There's a little bit more direction to the assessment than there is to the intervention. So I'll do the assessments first. Um, if, you're actually, if you're actually looking for just a cookbook on brain injury, there's no such thing out there. There are a couple of good resources, but as you are learning today, this is a much more complex area than we could you know, put into one book. The minute you, we tell you that this is exactly like this one kiddo with a brain injury, the next kiddo with a brain injury is gonna walk in and look completely different. So it's more a matter of thinking along the lines of this philosophy than it is to, f to feel like you have to know every single intervention or every assessment. But we try to narrow it down for you and make it as easy as possible. And Heather likes to say, your easy button is this matrix. The matrix is what is coming around to you right now. You are getting a hard copy of the matrix. 
You can also get the matrix electronically on CoKids. And here's a picture of CoKids. So in your spare time, go to CoKids and just play around with this a little bit. If you click on matrix there, what you will get is basically um, a nice, easy way to go from area of concern, click on, I think it's processing speed, click on it, and it will take you right over to what tests might I give to look at processing speed? And what might that look like in the classroom to the teachers? And what might that look like behaviorally from the teacher's perspective or a parent's perspective? And what interventions might I give? Okay, so it will give you a lot of ideas on assessment and intervention on the skill deficit. And that's how you're gonna widen your toolkit. Not by knowing that for, a, for TBI you do this, and ADHD you do that, but if it's a kiddo with attentional issues, whether it's from a traumatic brain injury, and almost every kid who has a traumatic brain injury has some level of attentional issues because it's so foundational. You're gonna apply the interventions and the assessments no matter what the different diagnosis is. Okay, so, um, so play around with it. It's really pretty fantastic and there are a lot of places around, of course open to anyone to use in our nation and we get a lot of hits on it because it just helps to organize our thinking. All right, so I'm not gonna go into all of this because it's in your handouts because there are more assessments on there than I could ever put on these slides and because you don't need for me to read this to you. Um, I would just say a word of caution. This, the advisory group that came up with this list of different assessments for you, they are all your local educators. They're speech language, OTs, a couple of school psychologists, some social workers, um, nurse, uh, who else? Yeah, related services primarily. These are folks who we've been sitting around putting our heads together and researching for you the areas of assessment that are gonna most fit the skill deficit that you are identifying is a concern. We did not put a single test on there that is a, not a test that a, a school professional could give, okay? So you know that there's a lot of, of interest, of course, with, with any of this brain-based stuff and executive functioning for neuropsychologists to test. But there are so few neuropsychologists in our state, they're hard to get into, it takes months and months. It's very expensive. And what we really wanted to do is to really empower you guys to be school-based neuroeducational assessors, all right? So as, you, as I scroll through these, you will see that these are all tests that you may use within your scope of practice and you have, when you have confidence and competence to use these, you just have to kind of play with them a little bit until you feel comfortable with them. But that's what this list is about, okay? The other thing I wanna say before I start running through the list is that these are some nice suggestions of different tests out there. If you don't happen to have them in your school district, uh, we at CDE are not saying you have to go out and buy them, okay? We are just suggesting these are some nice things to consider, and if you happen to have them in your school district, use them, go beyond your typical testing, and or borrow from your neighbors and play with these a little bit, and if you like them, it might be something that your district might wanna buy, okay? But that, just wanna put that word of, that disclaimer out there, all right? Um, so, you can see, as we go through this, if you're, uh, if you're intervention or your in interactions with the teacher and the parents and your observation form says you think it's really an attentional issue you might pull out parts of these tests to look at attention okay and as I said any time a kiddo I know a kiddo has a traumatic brain injury and they have a, attentional issues I'm not surprised attentional issues is one of the most common problems post traumatic brain injury and it is not the same thing as ADHD, okay? And so just a word of caution, if you have a child who is, you know, a teacher says, I think this kid has ADHD, and that's what they say to the parent, but you know this kid had a traumatic brain injury, you're gonna want to talk to that parent 
because attentional issues secondary to a traumatic brain injury isn't going to necessarily be treated the same way as ADHD because ADHD is often treated with stimulants. And stimulants on a, in a brain that has been traumatized could be problematic. So, but you're not going to be at all surprised that you see attentional issues secondary to any kind of a brain injury because that's foundational. That's how low, you know, we tend to kind of go down to the lowest level sometimes with these injuries. So you can see here that we talk just about parts of tests. Um, if you, for example, for myself, as a psychologist, if I have two hours to test a kid, I may not choose to give a whisk, which is going to take an hour and a half of my time. I may pick and choose parts of batteries that I'm going to really be looking for certain things. Probably working memory, probably um, some things off the whisk I'll do for memory, probably parts off the NEPSI I'll do for attention, probably parts off the RAMO I'll do for memory and learning. And in that two hour time, I'm going to come up with more information that is help more helpful to figuring out what level of skill deficit we have than if I did an entire whisk, which often just sort of um, waters down kind of evens out all my scores, okay? And that would be the same for the self and all. You know that some of those bigger assessments give you bigger numbers, but they don't drill it down enough. So let me just run through these, and you can see as we go, the NEPSI is a good example, the brief, the CAS. If you're looking at inhibition, the NEPSI has an inhibition part. The brief, again, of course, is the uh, executive functioning. There's another one out there, the CEF, the CEFI. There's a couple of new executive functioning things coming up. It's so big. Um, the decafs have some parts of this for inhibition. If you're drilling down to memory, you might pick and choose some of these. Um, I really love the RAML. It's not on here, but it's in there. It's on our matrix. Um, I use a lot of the parts of the visual memory and um, the verbal memory off the RAML. It has it has. Uh, immediate, it has delayed, it has embedded in stories um, so that you can get kind of the, the sense of whether or not if it's rote memorization versus if you embed it in meaningful information. All those things are important when you're trying to advise a teacher. If their memory is not sticking with rote memorization, let's embed it in something a little bit deeper. So those kinds of things. Processing speed. Here are some examples with that. Um, of course, there's something off the WISC. There's things off the Woodcock-Johnson on processing speed. So just some suggestions. And then sensory motor. And sensory motor, you might, of course, you're going to do all of this as a multidisciplinary team assessment. Um, but you might call in OT, PT with sensory motor. You can use some things that are kind of, you know, that pull a little bit more from kind of that Asperger's autism side. We, go, we keep going down to this orange level because this is often the area where the deficits are with many of our kids um, that end up making executive functioning and behavior a problem. It's often on this very foundational level. It can be somewhat in learning as well. So here are some ideas with learning assessments and visual spatial assessments. Again, your OT, PT is going to be very helpful with this. And then, of course, your language assessments. And then with this, you also want to drill it down to different parts of language. Um, and don't forget social pragmatics, which there are a lot of kids who can talk a blue streak. And they'll talk circles around you, but they're not making a whole lot of sense. Um, and at some point, that will become obvious um, through either the way you assess it or it becomes obvious to their peers. All right, so you want to look at that as well. And then social emotional competency. Um, there are definitely some ways you can kind of look at this. These are checklists as well, um, where you're looking at BASCs. The whole idea of what's the function of behavior, and what's the intervention for behavior, we'll go into a little bit more, because that's really the outcome of the social-emotional competency. And then executive functioning. And Heather went through some great examples of that this morning. And you can kind of tell that really the whole interest in executive functioning, um, you can see, is basically taking away the idea that we assume all kids of whatever age would have this level of executive functioning and just getting frustrated or angry when they don't. This whole view that we're talking about is really just to stop the process and say, maybe we need to bring it down and actually teach that. And with that whole approach, 
has come this new, this new world of executive functioning training that is so popular right now. It's not that we didn't know there were executive functioning before. It's just that we sort of assumed that it would typically develop. And when it didn't, um, we as educators had to stop and say, maybe we need to drill it down, teach it specifically, and then start you know, generalizing it and going from there. So, so there are more and more of these ideas with executive functioning. The um, Dawson and Guerre book, the, there are tons of workbooks, worksheets in that. So there's really a lot of information out there for executive functioning. Um, and it's just a matter of trying to make that now fit with you taking your kids and taking the time to work it through. So executive functioning, you know, there's lots that you can do with this. Um, and if you want to actually assess it through uh, the brief or the CEFI, or you know any of those worksheets that you can get in those workbooks um, that will also help to direct you with what specific area is of concern in executive functioning because as we only show you I think five here but you know it could be you know so many different things whether it's initiation or whether it's mental flexibility there are different parts of executive functioning so we'll run through those quickly mental flexibility planning organization initiation and actually, as you are doing your observation, um, brain injury observation form, you're already getting a sense. I mean, there are many times that if you do a brief, you're gonna, you could probably figure out what the brief is gonna say um, just by talking to the parent and the, and the teacher, because they're telling you, he won't get started. That's initiation. He, um, you know, when we have a substitute teacher, he can't go with the flow, he can't handle it. That's mental flexibility. So you're already thinking along those lines. Um, so whether you need it specifically kind of spelled out in the brief, which nicely does it, or you're kind of figuring that based upon what you know. All right, so, and then cognitive ability, achievement, all of that. That's the highest level, right? I mean, and this is the park testing and the TCAPs and all of those kinds of things. But this is often where we as educators go in to assess at the top of the pyramid, not down here. And so, you know, and we have all of these, of course, and you, you know, definitely can use those. So that's, that's, all, that's all we're gonna go into for assessment. You guys can kind of go through that at your leisure or with your first kiddo that comes up and you're like, well, what do I wanna do and pick and choose some different things to play with, all right? Intervention. Intervention is one of those things that is always all, all the educators that come to our trainings really want to have some things to walk out with, right? And I notice that when we do the jigsaw puzzle, everybody loves the interventions on the back, right? And that's why sometimes these things walk away and they get stuck in bags and they don't <laughs> come back to Heather for our next training. But I'm gonna remind you that you don't, this is just a short list of interventions. There is a much more complete list in here. So download your brain injury manual from the CDE website or from the CoKids website and you will have all the interventions. So in terms of intervention, this has always been our hardest thing because we want to give you basically the cookie cutter, but there is no such thing, right? Um, when you look at all the other different disability groups and what they have done for interventions, you can see that they have over time really figured out a way to kind of provide you that toolkit, right? This is just a, um, a graphic that I use when I'm teaching my students or working with the psychologist that I was working with in the district I was at to help them figure out what is the intervention that goes with the skill deficit. So if we borrow from some of our other areas, we will, you can see how you can use this, okay? So if we had this first case. Do I have a volunteer who will stand up and read, be my classroom teacher and read this out? Anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> so, nice of you to volunteer. Happy to do it. <laughs> All right, this student is extremely busy and off task. When it is time to do academic work, he is always the last to get started. He tries to engage his neighbor in shenanigans. He will try to draw the attention of the class onto him. I always try to keep him close to me when teaching because I have to give him gentle reminders to start the task, to stay on task, to keep his hands to himself, to sit on his bottom, etc. Thank you, classroom teacher. 
All right, has anybody in this room ever had a teacher come to you and say, this is their concern? <laughs> that was excellent, wasn't it? Was it was so believable that he was the classroom teacher. Do we know how to deal with this? Do we know what this disability is probably going to be? What would we guess? Is there some diagnosis that you would, you would think about with this? Has to, he's touching other kids, he has to sit on his hands. ADD, right? It might be ADD, ADHD, attention problem. And as educators, do we know how to deal with ADD or intervene on attentional issues? Yeah, if we believe that, this di that the diagnosis is ADD, it's a self-regulation problem, we might do an intervention like how does your engine run? Nice OT program. If it's a self-regulation problem, we might do a sticker chart. Help him to stop and think, right? Poor initiation, that's what you guys were talking about. And so we're gonna have to do a little bit of teacher initiation. So Carl was standing next to him, helping him get started. So we know how to do that. It's an attention or a focus problem. Maybe preferential seating. We're gonna put the kiddo next to us so that we can keep him on task. So, do we know how to deal with ADD or ADHD? Yeah, we don't get scared by that. Who wants to be my PE teacher? Any volunteers? All right, case number two, specials PE. I first met David when PE came up as specials in the middle of September. The first time he came to the gym, he walked over to the side of the gym with his hands over his ears. He walked around with his hands on his ears, humming to himself and walking and walking and walking and walking. Tried to go over and touch him and he kind of shrieked and pulled away. I didn't know what to do, so I asked the TA for another kid to go over and follow him around the gym. She was finally able to get him to calm down and she asked him to go to the nurse's office. Later I found out that he never made it to the nurse's office because he said he got lost. Thank you. Anybody in here ever have a kiddo like that? Yes. All right. The walking around, humming. What does that make you think of? Autism. autism. Do we know how to deal with kids with autism? Yeah. Now we are the pros at dealing with kids with autism. There was a time, I remember, where we were not. And I remember assessing my very first kid at Children's Hospital way back when, 100 years ago, and saying, oh, this kid has Asperger's. I better take a picture of this because I will never see this again. I had to look it up in the book. I was like, well, he has every one of these things. Little did I know, right? He was, he was lining up all his trains. So yes, now we know how to deal with autism, Asperger's, um, in a way we never did earlier. We sort of let it all be medical, right? So if we think that this is a um, Asperger's or spectrum kind of problem, sensory problem, do we know how to deal with it? Yeah. If it's sensory overload, we might tell everyone not to touch David. If it's uh, that he got lost, we might actually, if it was important for him to go to the nurse on a regular basis, like to get his medication, we might put those little steppers down, you know, little feet things that he can follow. If it's sensory overload, we might do a social story. Those work beautifully. I don't know why, but they work beautifully. If it's sensory overload, maybe earphones. Maybe it was too loud in the, in the gym class, right? And maybe we could just avoid gym right now. Maybe now is not the right time for David to go to that. Okay, so do we know how to handle this? Yeah. So one more case. Who wants to be my playground aide? Any volunteers? It's not hard. You see how well your colleagues have done? You want to do it? Thank you. I'm a playground um, aide. I'm already sliding up with falls on this kid. He charges out of the classroom onto the playground as he just runs over everyone else in his way. He is rough with other kids. It's like he doesn't care. Something that happens quite often is that by the end of recess, he will come up to me pouting or crying or mad. He says that no one will play with him or he'll say that someone was mean or unfair to him. So I started paying more attention and I saw him run right up to a kid, grab the ball away from him and run off with it. 
when the other kid ran after him, he yelled and he kicked and he screamed. I don't know how that kid is going to get any friends that way. Thank you, Playground Aid. All right. Does anyone know a kid like this? Yeah. Yes. And what do we think this is probably? Some kind of a social skill concern. Maybe just don't, don't have some of those underlying social skills, right? Do we have any interventions for that? Absolutely. If it's a spatial awareness problem, we might do some role playing, do that bubble around you kind of thing, right? Maybe they can't read the social cues. There are some kids who really cannot read, smiling versus frowning, you know, versus angry face. So, you know, the second step program has that, where you actually teach them the faces, maybe a social skills group where we practice the faces. Limited empathy, maybe he just doesn't understand what it's like to pull that ball away from somebody else. Anybody ever use Why Try? There's an empathy part in Why Try, so that's a program you can use. Turn taking, maybe skill streaming. There's uh, a couple of different lessons in there. Conflict resolution, um, ART, Peace for Kids. There's um, CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, that we use short term with kids for conflict resolution. Or maybe it's just impulsivity. He can't stop himself long enough to make a better choice, which is often the issue with behavior. Maybe stop, relax, and think. So could we handle a kiddo like this? Do we have the interventions for this? We absolutely do. None of these three kids scare us, and we have lots of interventions for them. So let me tell you a story of David. So David is actually a kiddo that we had seen at one point. And he was, the, he was one of three boys living with mom and dad. And he was a kiddo that was brought to our attention, thank you, on the brain injury team. He was always described as a very active child. Um, before birth, after birth, he was a difficult toddler. And he approached and reached his developmental milestones on time. But of course, gross motor was faster and above all the others. In kindergarten, he was busy, busy, busy. In first grade, his teachers first heard the teachers, con his parents first heard the teacher's concern for hyperactivity and poor attention to task. At the end of first grade, his parents had asked them to consider going to a pediatrician for an evaluation for ADHD. But they were concerned that that would mean medication for their child and they didn't want to do that. In second grade, David was described as a very smart boy but would not apply himself. And he was called into the principal's office after he and a female peer got into an altercation over a pencil, and that pencil accidentally stabbed the girl. Um, and so at the end of third grade, parents were again encouraged to seek outside evaluation and possible treatment for how his behavior was now impacting him. But during the summer between third and fourth grade, David and his cousins and siblings were jumping on a trampoline in their backyard. David came down too close to the side of the trampoline, hit his head on the bar. The kids at the scene described a short period of time when David was out of it, but he was coming back around again when adults got to the backyard. He was taken to the emergency room. He was kept overnight for observation. He suffered a hairline fracture in the left temporal region and a concussion. He was discharged from the hospital the next day with the reassurance that he was fine. Parents noticed that he was actually less active for the rest of the summer and had a much shorter fuse. In the fall, David started fourth grade. His parents didn't tell the school about the incident over the summer because they felt it would not be relevant this many months later. In fact, they were hoping that his calmer activity level would be a positive change for him at school. So at teacher conferences in October, David's teacher said, case one, I can't get him to sit still. I have to ask him to sit on his hands. His attention is off task. And his specials teacher, his PE teacher said, David was the one in the gym that was humming. He couldn't handle the sound. He couldn't handle all of the commotion in the PE classroom. And the paraprofessional on the playground said, that was David. He was no longer taking turns. He was taking the ball around away from other people. And he was doing all of these behaviors. Okay? Now, if I called you guys in and said, what is the intervention for David? this year because he had a traumatic brain injury. Would you have come up with all of those different interventions? Or would you have called Heather Hotchkiss at the Department of Education and say, I don't know what to do with David. He has a traumatic brain injury. 
But when we take the traumatic brain injury kind of scariness away, and we bring it down to the skill deficit, did you know what to do? Did you have a million different interventions for these kids? Yes. So the intervention piece of traumatic brain injury um, and Asperger's and autism and ADHD, all of those are not separate cookie cutter cookbooks. Otherwise, you would have about 18 of them on your bookshelf. And you'd have to pull them out with every time you had a kid with a different label. The interventions for all of these kids that are all neurologically based are down to the level of the skill deficit. And then you may apply them across the different disability labels however you like. And if one doesn't work, you try another. Okay? So this book is kind of your cookbook for traumatic brain injury, but not really. This takes it down to the level of the skill deficit, gives you ideas for interventions. And so use this for all kinds of other ones. But there's another resource I want to show you, and that is this. How many of you have seen the Brain Stars program? Okay, so the Brain Stars book was a book written by Jeannie Dice Lewis, who was the rehab psychologist at Children's Hospital for 20, 30 years, something like that. And she wrote this book from the perspective of traumatic brain injury. And what she did was beautiful. She also wrote this in such a way that the yellow tabs tell you about brain injury. The blue tabs tell you what to do if it's attention what to do if it's processing speed, what to do if it's memory. And once you get to the blue tabs, you never, she never says traumatic brain injury again. In those chapters with the blue tabs, it's just if a kid has processing speed problems, here's what you do. And so this is applicable for all kids, just like we've talked about. Now these have been around for many, many years and many of your schools have them. And you might need to go look for them I know in Cherry Creek we bought many with our Medicaid dollars and they're in a lending library and you can check them out and use them for all of your kids. Um, we didn't put this as a resource on your list because unfortunately Jeannie Dice Lewis passed away a year and a half ago. And this book has stayed and probably will stay as this is maybe forever, I don't know. I don't know if anyone is going to pick this up and rewrite it and start selling it again. I'm not sure if it's available to you guys. So if you have them in your, in your, in your schools, um, look for them, hold on to them, because they are golden. And they might become more golden if they never change from here. But they are very helpful. But what we have done is Jeannie Dice Lewis, before she passed away, worked with us on this brain injury manual for CDE. And her chapter is chapter two in here. And while we are rewriting this book, we are not touching chapter two. It will always stay the same you know, in, in honor of her. This is the living um, manual. This is the book that will change and grow and move with our field. So we have tried to take the concepts here that Jeannie started and put them into the CDE manual and we'll keep that moving. And, and so you will always have this, but you may not have this, all right? But you can still find these all over the place. And because of how helpful my little volunteers were, here, Carl, you get one as a classroom teacher. Thank you. Um, we have right here, we have one right here. This is my, my playground supervisor. And right over here, we have the manual for you, OK? All right. OK. Any questions or any comments about David? All right. So since you already have all the skills you need for traumatic brain injury, because you see all kinds of other kids all the time, let's move on then a little bit to applying this to some cases.